The public has a long-held fascination with detectives. Detectives see a side of life the average person is never exposed to. In this podcast series, I Catch Killers with Gary Jubilant, I'll be interviewing a whole range of people you come across as a detective, including police, bad guys and victims. I spent 34 years as a cop. For 25 of those years, I was catching killers. That's what I did for a living. I was a homicide detective. I'm no longer just interviewing bad guys. Instead, I'm taking the public into the world in which I operated. The guests I selected have amazing stories from all sides of the law. The interviews are raw and honest, just like the world they inhabited. No one who steps into the world of crime comes out unchanged. Join me now while I take you into this world. This episode of I Catch Killers contains conversations that some listeners may find confronting or triggering. Discretion is advised. Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. Today's podcast is going to be difficult and emotional, not only for the guests but also for myself. I think it may also challenge the listener and raise questions about the justice system and racism in this country. Today we're going to talk about the murder of three children. These children lived in the same street in a small country town on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. They were murdered over a six-month period. No person has been convicted of these horrific crimes. Evidence suggests these murders were committed by the same person, which, if true, makes this person a serial killer. The initial police investigation was flawed. In fact, a former New South Wales Police Commissioner has come out publicly and apologised to the victims' families, admitting police could have done it better. We're going to be talking to the victims' families today. So you can have a full understanding of what these families have suffered, I'm first going to outline details of these murders. These are the facts of the case. On the 13th of September, 1990, Colleen Ann Walker Craig, age 16, disappears from a party at the Barrowville Aboriginal Mission. On the 4th of October, 1990, Evelyn Claris Greenup, age 4, disappears from a house on the Barrowville Aboriginal Mission. On the 1st of February, 1991, Clinton Thomas Speedy Duro, age 16, disappears from a caravan near the Barrowville Aboriginal Mission. That's three kids, all known to each other, living in the same street on the outskirts of a small country town who have just disappeared over a six-month period. Could you imagine the police response and public outrage if that happened on the North Shore in Sydney? The sad part about this situation is that the police response was grossly inadequate at the time. Anyway, getting back to the details of the case. On the 18th of February 1991, Clinton Speedy, the 16-year-old boy, his remains were found in bushland on the outskirts of the town along the Congarini Road. That's seven kilometres from the mission. His body was just dumped in bushland beside a track. Animals had gotten to Clinton's body, which was now just skeletal remains. Postmortem revealed he'd had a penetrative wound to his skull. He had a pillow slip tucked down the front of his pants. No shoes, and there was a blanket that had come from a caravan he was last seen alive in. The occupant of that caravan was a white man named who was just 25 years old at the time. Although charged with Clinton's murder and Evelyn's murder, has not been convicted and has been acquitted of both charges. It's important that the listener understands that. On the 8th of April 1991, was charged with Clinton Speedy's murder. On the 17th of April 1991, the clothing 16-year-old Colleen Walker was wearing when she disappeared from a party at the mission was found dumped in the Nambucca River, weighted down with rocks. As luck would have it, a fisherman snagged her clothing, otherwise we'd not have discovered her clothing. Obviously, when clothing has been discarded in that fashion, it's extremely suspicious. What is also interesting and is of concern, is the location. It was just 1.2 kilometres past the end of Congarini Road. That is the same road where Clinton's body was so callously dumped. On the 27th of April 1991, four-year-old Evelyn Greenup's skeletal remains were found dumped in bushland along the Congarini Road. The same way Clinton's body was dumped. One of her shoes was missing, and significantly, she also had a penetrative wound to her head, just like Clinton. So there you have it. Three children living in the same street, brutally murdered over a six-month period. How did it happen, and why is it still unsolved? I became involved in the reinvestigation in 1997. That's six years after the murders, and it was as a result of the Barrable families and the Indigenous community complaining about the inadequacies of the original investigation. 
To understand how I felt about what happened to the families, I think can be best captured in evidence I gave at a 2014 New South Wales parliamentary inquiry about these murders. This is a quote from my evidence. Having worked on this matter since 1996, I feel that I'm well placed to say that the families have been let down by the justice system. Given the situation that the families found themselves in, it would be reasonable for them to assume that the authorities would provide suitable response to a serial killer preying on a community, as any community would. Unfortunately, this was not provided. Issues have impacted on this investigation. It's very nice for society to say that all victims are treated equally. Unfortunately, in this situation, I do not think that is entirely correct. I'm a homicide detective. I'm not a do-gooder or a bleeding heart. However, race, and to a lesser degree, socioeconomic factors have impacted on the manner in which these matters have been investigated. I've been investigating crimes for 20 years, and I'm still shocked by the lack of interest that has been shown in this matter, and I do not say that lightly. I've been investigating homicides for 20 years. We have a serial killer and three children were murdered. It's been heartbreaking to see the family suffering. The only time they seem to get things happening is when they attract the media's attention and when they publicly protest. That's very unfortunate. The families told me the reason when I first met them in 1997. They said it's because we're Aboriginal. At the time when I met the families, I did not believe them. Unfortunately, the truth of the matter is, having worked with the families now for the past 18 years, I think they've identified the problem, and that's very unfortunate. Today's guest on I Catch Killers are family members of the murdered children, and they have agreed to come on the podcast to tell their stories. Let me welcome to the podcast, first of all, Colin Walker's brother, Lucas. How are Hi. you? I'm all right, thanks. Thanks for coming on, Lucas. I, I, know it's, uh, I know it's tough talking about it, and you've had to talk about it uh, too many times, but uh, I, I think it's important that uh, people understand what uh, your family's gone through and the community's gone through. We also have uh, Michelle Lulu Staddams, who is Evelyn's, who is Evelyn's auntie. Uh, hello, Lulu. Hey, Gary. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I oh, know. It's it's it is tough talking about this, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And you've had to talk about it too many times. And we also have Leonie, Clint Speedy's sister-in-law. Welcome, Leonie. Hi, Gary. Thanks. Well, thanks for coming on and. Uh, Look, I know this has been going on for a long time and uh, your efforts to get justice for your murdered uh, children uh, have been quite astounding. But for the start of this podcast, I want people to understand who the children were. So um, Colin was the first of the uh, children to disappear. Lucas, you were eight at the time. How did that uh, impact on your family? Um You know, she was a very loving person. Our family was very close. Um, She was one of six. So mum and dad had, you know, all of us and she was the second eldest. So she um, was very close to me because she was like a second mum. You know, she would always be helping out with mum and dad. Um, Yeah, it was very devastating. Um, You know, being eight at the time, I can recall my mum and dad moving us to Barraville because the police weren't doing anything and my mum wanted to be there every day so that she can search for her if, you know, if anybody comes forward with any information or anything like that. She just wanted to be there so then, you know, she could not stop the searching because yeah. the police weren't doing anything at all. They, they just basically turned her away from the police station and, yeah, it was, it was really hard at the time, you know, How- because I... How did you find, like, what's your memories of Colleen as a sister? She used to take us down, because we, at home, we live very close to the creek and the, the beach, and she used to take us swimming all the time. She used to, to double me down on the bike. We used to go swimming on the weekends or, so, you know, sometimes in the afternoon after school, we'd go down there. Um, she was just always just doing stuff for us younger kids because she was the second eldest and, and dad was working a lot of the times and I had an older brother in a wheelchair. So um, mum was a lot, you know, busy with him a lot. Yeah. So um, Colleen used to do a lot for us and always used to be around us all the time. You know, she was a very loving, kind person um, who just loves her family so much. Yeah, and I, I see the photos of her and she looked like uh, she had the world ahead of her. 
um, yeah. a pretty lady, 16-year-old girl, and just about to uh, step out and experience life. Yeah, she really loved kids. She was doing, when she did her um, prac work for school, she wanted to do it at the preschool because she wanted to work with quick kids when she grew up yeah. and left school. Um, she liked kids so much, and she always wanted to be around them and all the time. So, mm. yeah, I, I could definitely see her being like a, a school teacher or something if she was still here today. Yeah, and you must often think about that as well. Yeah, I do a lot. Um, I always think about um, what would where would she be if she was still here and how many kids she would have. You know, having my other sisters have their kids and a couple of them now are grandparents. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's sad to think about what Colin could have had, you know. We could have been here sharing all of our Christmases and Easter's together as a family. Yeah. It, it, mm. it goes on and on, doesn't it, the pain? Yeah. Um, Lulu, Evelyn. Oh, she was she was Rebecca's first daughter, Billy's first girl. And uh, she was just a lovely child. She just... She was quite gentle soul. She was, um, you didn't know she was in the room unless she pulled on your clothes, you know. She'd pull on your clothes to the point if she wanted to drink a water or something like that. And her brother Aaron would always talk for her. And um, she'd, she, but in, in, in saying that, she could also be quite mischievous, you know. She used to stick um, marbles up. Aaron's nose and the baby <laughs> put him in the rock he'd be in the walk and then she'd run him into the wall or something like that so she, you know she loved the outdoors and going walking we had to always take off our shoes before we walked into Beck and Bill's house, um, unit in Waterloo yeah um, down in Sydney they lived in one of them high rises there and you always had to take your shoes off and hide them because she, as soon as she seen shoes she thought Oh, someone's taken me out for a walk. Even if you, even if yeah. you just walked in, yeah. just see shoes and she, she assumed you'd take her for a walk. Um, I, I see the pictures of uh, Evelyn and uh, I, I don't think you can see a cute child. The, the pretty little thing that she was. Oh, she was beautiful. Mm. Blonde curly hair. Beautiful big blue eyes. Rosy cheeks. Yeah. I don't know how someone could hurt somebody so gentle. How um, how's the the impact it's had obviously on on everyone, but uh, Beck, her mum, and Billy, both of them. It's just devastated them. They're not the same, you know. They've lost their world. You know, they've had other kids after that, but you know, they they're the part of their heart taken out. Someone's put a hole in their heart and it's not can't be replaced yeah the, the, the pain there isn't it yeah and you know they feel like they've let her down mm. you know they haven't looked after and that and it's not their fault but you know and then no one no nothing's gonna fix that hole yeah. nothing's gonna bring her back and she Evelyn's just left a massive hole in our family, yeah, even our um, extended families, and that <coughs> you come to gatherings and or your birthdays, your funerals, whatever that's happening in the families, and you look around that Becca and Bill's family, and you see somebody's missing, yeah. and you wonder, you always wonder what if, what what if she was here, what would it be like now? You know, it's not a, the trauma that they've suffered is just intergenerational. It's just affected their kids. It's affected well, our it, kids. Well, it, it's, chi it's changed everyone, hasn't it? It has. It's, everyone's still confused. Everyone's still angry. It was. We still haven't got answers as to what's happened, why this has happened, where Colleen is, because Colleen's our family too. I don't. I don't think people fully appreciate the the ripple effect when someone's life is taken, um, and the anger, the the pain, the suffering, and uh, yeah, a four year old child life um, taken, and then we have Colleen, and uh, 
your parents, you still don't know uh, what's happened to them because we haven't got the body back. No, um, and that's one of the hardest things. It's just, you know, not even knowing where she is. Yeah. Um, what we would really love is to, to bring her home so we can bury her with I, her family. I, I understand that and I hear that said so many times from uh, victims' families where uh, their loved one, where they haven't found the remains and uh, just want to bring uh, bring the person home. Um, Leonie, Clinton, tell us about Clinton. Well, I never knew Clinton. I came to the family in 1993, I think November 93, but I feel like I, I knew, know him very yeah. well because... He was just always kept alive, you know, from the time I met June. Yep. Um, when I met her first, when, when I met Marbuck. Um, you know, Marbuck, uh, Clinton's. Marbuck's Clinton's brother, brother. yeah. Yep. Um, Marbuck didn't really talk talk about it for a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, but um, it was it's it's a legacy that's sort of been brought down in the family, you know, with. with our kids that you know he was a mad michael jackson fan danced like michael jackson you know so my kids got taught by their father how yeah. to dance like even though he would never dance in public but he taught the boys and it was yeah. sort of like carrying their uncle's legacy and it's like they know him and they feel the pain they see the pain that their grandparents and their aunties and uncle went through and and they feel it like they yeah. know him well, that, that pain has been passed on, hasn't it? Yeah. And I, I, I see the pain, I see the anger yeah. um, that uh, come, comes out from it. Yeah. So, and again, I, I keep saying, and like having the three of you here together, I, I get really frustrated when people say it's happened a long time ago, move on, get on, on with your life. From what I see, you can't get on with your life in a situation like this. No, you can't. You know... There's somebody missing in our family. Yeah. A very important person, an integral part of our... Like, it's like chopping off your arm. Yeah. Chopping off your leg. You're always going to miss you it. You know, you're always going to miss it. You are like a person with an amputee. They'll say the same thing. It's like that with us, with our family members. Yeah. Mm. You know, and, and it'd be ten times worse for Mooney and Michael because they don't have Colleen's remains. Mm. You know, so that, you know... They don't know where she is. We know where Clinton and Evelyn are, but we don't know why. Yeah. Why are they buried six foot under? Yeah. Let, let's talk about uh, the Colleen for a sec, because um, one of the saddest things I see with the whole situation is uh, your mum's efforts to find Colleen's remains, and uh, she'll follow up any lead. She'll go searching the national park if someone says there's a rumour she wants it followed up looking for Colleen's remains. And it, I can sense she's not going to get peace until she finds no, Colleen's well, remains. No, I don't think... I think if it was any parent, they would feel the same. And oh, 100%. Do the same. Yeah. Um, and, you know, over the years, there have been many people that say, you know, there could be this information or that information. Yeah. And, of course, she's going to, to you know, um, follow it up and, and see if any of it's true or not. I yeah. think she just has to do that just so then she can be at peace and say, well, I'm, I'm, I've tried and, I, you know, I've tried everything that I can. Yeah. You know, even to this day, she still tries and she, st she just feels um, really sad, like she's let Colleen down because... Um, every lead that she has and everything she has done mm. has just not getting her anywhere. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. always leading us back to to the first point of yeah. you know, and we just don't have anything to go by. You know, yeah, just finding her clothes and you know, not knowing anything else. It, it's very hard. So I think if anybody had put themselves in that situation, um, they'd probably do the same. And just keep looking, you know, and like and when people say to you, like you said, you know, it happened a long time ago, I respond to them and say, well, if that was your child, would you still be here doing what I'm yeah. doing today? You know, making them put themselves in that situation. They can always say what they want to say, but yeah. they don't know how it is until they've been through it themselves. Yeah, it's a lack of understanding, isn't it, yeah. when, they, uh, when they make a comment like that, just 
fully don't appreciate the the significance exactly. and when we talk about Colleen's clothes and it, it, taking back to the, the time in the uh, in 1991 when the clothes were found they were weighted down with rocks in a river the clothes that she was last seen alive yes. in and uh, so and we haven't got her remains back and I, I can understand the pain that that causes speculating on what uh, what happened Lulu you were around at the time when the children started disappearing and uh, talk us through that, what the feel in the community was, what the frustration was. Well, at, at the beginning it was like, what's happening? You know, it was just bewilderment, you know, because this is a small country town where everybody knows everybody. All the black fellows know the white fellows, white fellows know the black fellows. We all grew up together. This just didn't ha happen. Mm. And we all looked after each other's kids on the mission there. And you know, it was just that at first, and then Colleen went missing first, so everyone's looking around, asking questions, what's going on, and and then a couple of weeks later, Evelyn goes missing. Then we're starting to get worried, really worried. Then, and we're starting to get angry, yeah. we're angry now, because there's no police reaction. Mm. There's none whatsoever. There's none for Colleen. You know, I, I firmly believe if they would have started, did something about Colleen, Evelyn and Clinton might have still been here. You know, mm -hmm. so nothing was done at Colleen's. They disregarded everything Mooney and Michael said to them. And then, you know, then it, to make matters worse, they disregarded what I had said to them when I first went into the police station. And Tell me about that when you first went into the police station. So this is uh, Evelyn, four years old. Yeah. I just got home from work from uh, um, in Coffs Harbour, and uh, it was seven thirty, around about seven thirty, and I was laying down in the room, and uh, my sister Penny come to the door and said, "Here, talk, talk this is this one," and she was referring to my sister Rebecca, and I said, "Ooh," and she said, "Here, Becca, here." We call her Becca, and um, so I said, "Here, what's the matter?" She said, "Oh, Evelyn's missing." I can't find it. And I said, what do you mean she's missing? She said, I don't know where she is. And I said, when did you last see it? And she said 11 o'clock. But, yeah, so she said 11 o'clock. And, and then um, she, I said, okay then. I said, does Billy have any? She said, no. I checked with him and he didn't have her. I thought, and she said, she explained to me that she thought that Billy had had, him, had her and then he, Billy had thought that Rebecca had her. And, and, and to explain that, they lived three houses they apart. They lived three houses yeah. apart. They had separated yeah. at this stage. But the kids, you know, they knew where Dad was, so they'd just walk down the road. And this was on, mm. on the mission where everybody, this was a normal activity for them to do every morning to go down and see their dad or get up and go and see their mum in the morning. Yeah. And they walk, it's a house full, or every house they're pe filled with people that they're related to. And and people, sometimes people don't understand this either. And I, I've, I've talked about it, the, the shared parenting, that yeah. uh, when the children are pl playing around, all their families, all the, all the families are there, so everyone's looking after the children. Yeah, everyone's keeping an eye on each other's yeah. kids, you know. Um, Normally, I would have picked Evelyn up, her and her brothers, if her, I, I knew her mother, mother was drinking. But to my greatest guilt to this day, I didn't because I had to chose my work over to go and pick her up. And because I had to go to work. Yeah. And I, I didn't go and pick her up. And so. I said, well, come on back. I said, go and get that photo I found of her. I took of her the other week, one where she's sitting on the floor in the blue dress. We're going out the drive around to the houses and that. And this is dark time by now. It's getting dark. And so we drove around a bit, asked a few people, still no one knew. I said, right, I made the decision. We're going down to the police station. So I'd driven down to the police station there was one cop car there, the highway patrol, and I walked in. This is the, I went down to Maxwell Station. Yeah. That's another 13 k's away from us. 
And so I went down to Maxwell Station and I said, and there's one copper there. And I walked in and he said, oh yeah, well how can I help you? I said, look, um, I just want to report my niece missing. She's four years old and we can't find her. And he looked at her and he looked, he looked at the picture, he looked at me and he said, oh, well what do you want me to do about it? I'm just about to knock off. Not what you want to hear. And I'm just like, what do I do? And I'm just like, I'm just dumbfounded and I'm standing at this guy. I said, well, this is a four-year-old girl. She's missing. No one can find her. And he, and he asked me since when or something. And I, I said, I think around 11 o'clock because I wasn't sure because, like I said, I didn't know she was missing until 7.30 that night. And then he said, well, I'm just about to knock off. And that's all I could do because... He was a copper. I can't. I, I was always told you don't argue with coppers. How, how did you feel <coughs> when that was said to you? I was angry. I was angry as hell. I wanted to punch someone. I wanted to swear at him or something. But I knew I'd get in trouble and I'd be put in jail or something. Yeah. You know, uh, or get bashed even because you know that's what we were taught as kids. Don't talk back to the coppers. You get bashed, you get thrown in jail or something like that. Bad will happen to you. And so I just walked out and I went around to more family looking for her that night, driving around, telling everybody. Uh, that, uh, uh, like we're, we're talking a four-year-old child. and uh, four-year-old uh, child. We can look and uh, 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 they're all as important as each other, but we look at the response with uh, William Tyrrell when William disappeared and the response there. And uh, there was recently uh, another uh, a child over in Western Australia, that uh, a, a three-year-old that were just on the weekend that um, lost and the search that was set up. Was any of that done with... Uh, Ever? No, no, nothing was done like that. We had a boy, a young boy here with Down syndrome mm-hmm. a few years ago in Nambucca Heads. He went, he followed his dog and he was later found, I think, the next morning. Yep. But we had people from all over the mid north coast come up to look for that young boy and thank God he was found. Yeah, yeah. That was not done for my niece, mm. a four year old little girl. You know, we were told she went walkabout or we'd given her her away. How do you feel when that's been said to you? I'm, I'm totally disgusted and I just want to smash their face in whoever says that. Mm. You know, this is an innocent child. She hasn't been um, uh, confronted with... She's just growing up. She hasn't been subjected to the ways of the world and that. Yeah. Children are innocent in this world. Yeah. You know, and you know, we teach whatever they, we teach them at home, that's what they learn. But she was never taught racism, hmm. you know, and she she was taught love and caring and, and a part of a family. Well, it's... I really don't know what to say. I can I can feel the frustration, the anger, and I've seen it for the past twenty five years uh, with with you guys at uh, mistakes that were made uh, made then. Leonie, with uh, Clinton's disappearance now, uh, Clinton's was the third disappearance. So now you got a small country town and what a couple of thousand people, or not even that, the bearable fifteen hundred people perhaps, and you've got uh, now a third child's disappeared from the same area. Statistically, sorry, how is that possible for three kids to go missing from one street and somebody, three different people decide to come in and to take, make a decision to take a child off a street and dump their bodies in the same area or in the clothing in the same area? It's, 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 it's not possible. It's not possible. It hasn't happened. And I, I know when people have suggested to you guys, the families, that uh, these matters aren't linked, it's beyond ridiculous. The, the facts speak for themselves. Yeah. But uh, when Clinton disappeared, Leonie, what's the sense of it speaking to Thomas and uh, that Thomas being uh, uh, Clinton's dad? dad? Look, I... I think, like, I met June first and then I met Thomas later yep. on, but, you know, it's always been they believe that one person did it. Yep. And that person is responsible for the three murders. And I guess one thing I've learnt living in Aboriginal families, 
generally, they don't, black kids don't just disappear or mm. well, they don't go walk about. Someone in the family always knows where they are. So they're an, an aunties or, or a cousins or and but you always know yeah. where they are. They don't just disappear into thin air. So that, that's, but Clinton, I, I think, gets totally devastated. I mean, like, Billy and Becca, like, yeah. Many and Michael, it's it's changed Thomas and June's life. And I I, I see never with be the same. I see with Thomas uh, that mm. it's you can see the pain every time he's got to address it, and he, he yeah. fronts up and he, he talks about it because with your fight for justice, but you know it, it's painful for him. Yeah, because I mean he's oh he says it a lot, but you know you get your hopes built up, mm. and every time something's happened, we've. Been, you know, something positive's happened, and he says, and then you just get kicked in the guts. And you know, I think there's that underlying thought that this is never going to get solved because it's it's not going to happen. Because I mean, we have got a lot of momentum now, and we have got people behind us, but yeah. still, the people that make the decisions aren't, aren't making the right decisions, and and so they guess get let down again. And it's I first sort of knew about it i went to the trial i went to the verdict at clinton's trial and that's something i will never ever forget you know and that was in 94 i think uh, yeah 94. yeah and yeah. so uh, so people understand the the three kids have disappeared over a six month period uh, their remains have been found um evelyn's found along the congarini road and clinton's found along the congarini road yeah. and then colleen's clothing that she was wearing at the time of her disappearance was weighted down with rocks in the river at the end of the, the Congarini Road. So from a community point of view, from the family's point of view, and, and look, I think what people don't understand, and that's why I like bringing people up to Bearable to fully understand what goes on there. You all know each other. We're not talking, this is not a big suburb in Sydney. This is one street. This is the Peyton place. Yeah. Everybody knows everybody's business. Yeah. You know, this wasn't... This wasn't a time where social media was around and that. Yeah, but we knew everybody. Yeah. And we looked after each other's kids and we kept an eye on everybody's kids. Uh, we And we always knew when something was happening on the mission. I lived in town, but I always knew that if there was a party on there, there was something happening. There was a blue on the mission, you know. You always knew something, what was happening yeah. and who was involved. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I often think about that a lot because I just think, you know, if, if you just say you were at a party one night and you fell over, like the, ha the whole town will know by the next day, Yeah, which is very, um, you know, what I always think about, you know, somebody would have had to see something, mm. you know, or heard something and for nobody to come forward, it's very frustrating. And uh, assumptions that were made, like Colleen, uh, she was packed to go away to Gaduga that yeah. night. She was going away with her friends and she didn't turn up, but there was speculation that, oh, she'll be somewhere. Yeah. Um, or well, uh, she's ran away to the city or something. Yeah. But the, what people don't realise is that we, like I said before, we were a very close-knit family, you know, and, and if my sisters did go anywhere, then they'd have to call home. You know, you yeah. can always check in with our parents to see where they are. It's not like our parents ever abused us or anything in yeah. that way for us to run away, you know. And that was one of the, the things where she would always make sh sure she'd call mum and dad and tell yeah. her where she is. And that's when mum and dad got worried because they didn't hear anything from her. Yeah. I said it, uh, as I read out at the start in the parliamentary inquiry, that when I first met you guys in, uh, I think, round 97, um, you told me that uh, no one cares because we're Aboriginal. And I'll be honest with you, and I, I look at you now, I didn't think that was right. I really, I was naive. I did not think that was right. But uh, now, sitting here you know, 25 years later or more, um, I know it, it was right. What's your views on uh, how you were treated? I think it's downright disgusting. You know, in a day and age, this day and age, you know, this wasn't like the 1800s or something. This was 1999. And we're um, still dealing with racism and that. Yeah. And um, mm. saying, oh, is she your child? She's gone walkabout. You know, 
tar on us with the same brush and they were just all drunks. Yeah. You know? Mm. And um, it's, just, it's just, it's just unbelievable to fathom that people still think that way in this, this time, in this day and age, and, and, and how Australia says that there's no racism and that we're a country of multiculturalism and that, all stuff like that. Yeah, we might be that, but you don't like us black fellas, do you? Yeah, yeah. I hate to say that, yeah. and I re that really hurts me to say that because my dad's white. I've yeah. got a lovely bunch of um, white friends and that we were growing up with, and it just really hurts that a small amount of people just make it bad for everybody else. You know, under the skin, we're all the same. We've all got the same heart and great beaten blood around us and it's just wrong. I think you said after um, Evelyn's trial in 2006, you made a comment, not straight after, but in reference to it, that you felt like you, the family, were being judged on for the way that you lived your life and uh, yes. with the, the way that the, the jury were, were looking at things and the way the evidence was being presented, not fully understanding uh, the, our, the cultural things. Our, at Evelyn's trial, our lives were on trial, yeah. not the act of murder. Mm. Our lives were put on trial. Rebecca and Bill's life, my mum's life, how they, you know, like, yes, they were all drinking in that. And there was people in and out of the, out of the house all night and that. But you know what? Look at Madeline Kahn's parents. They went and they went and um, went out for dinner. Went out for dinner. They left the kids in the house by in the unit by themselves in a yeah. strange country, but no no one puts them down and you know questions their um, if they've neglected their kids and that. No, the whole world's out searching for this child, mm. but ours. They're looking at us, oh, we're just a bunch of blacks or, you know, they neglected their kids again or they must probably bashed them or sold them or something like that or they go and walk about. That's the first comment that are coming out, out of people's mouths. Yeah. You know? Mm. So you felt like you're on trial? Yeah. Rather than yeah. The, the person that's killed yeah. this young kid? Yeah. Well, that, that's, a, that's another point and I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on it. You're all part of the one community, you're all family members, you're related here, there, and the trials were done separately. Does that, I, I, well, I try to understand the judicial system, and but was that a source of frustration for you? Like when we were at Evelyn's trial in 2006, things couldn't be mentioned that for... Well, if I remember right, Abernathy said at Bellingen that all the three should be heard together. And yeah, yeah, at, that was He a, said that at... So that was at, a, at, that at, was at, a at, state in, coroner in yeah. 2004, there was an yeah. inquest held, yeah. and he made the recommendation Abernathy. that all, all three matters should be looked at together. Yes. Yeah. And see, um, but then we'll get the evidence, then no, we're not allowed to have all three together, and we're not allowed to mention the other two. That's why there's so much confusion and people are wondering um, um, if they're connected or not because they're only hearing part of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a, to get what happened to all three kids, you have to have the whole story. You have to know what happened to Colleen. You have to know what happened to Clinton mm. and the circumstances of their disappearance. Because. To understand. Or you're never going to get it. Yeah. And because of the inept investigations of the police at the time with Colleen's, Clinton's and Evelyn's and especially with Evelyn's and Colleen's, there's no forensic everything. Yeah. There's no DNA, there's nothing like that. Mm. There's no crime scene from where she went missing out of mum's room, um, the room in mum's place. There's no photographs, nothing like that. Well, I think the first time we searched that was five or six years later. Yeah. When we went... Uh, well, they didn't even do that five... I think they might have done it five or six weeks later. Mm. My mum gets up um, five o'clock every morning and clean out the house. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
So and she's the, most probably yeah. going missing at two o'clock. Yeah. Mum's gotten up at five o'clock and yeah. cleaned up the house, you know. Six, you know it, Opportunities missed. Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, what year was it that uh, Mr Scipioni came up? That was... Was that three or four years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Where he Who came, uh, the, the police, police commissioner yeah, yeah. came 2016. up. Yeah. 2016. 2016, yeah. he, he came up. And I, I thought that was uh, a step in the right direction. Uh, he came up and apologised. And I think his words were a long... He said, sorry, but things could have been done differently. And he apologises for that. So that's sort of an acknowledgement that things could have been done differently, but it doesn't make it... Uh, it doesn't help at all. It doesn't yeah. help anyone's situation. It, it's like yeah. two steps forward, three steps back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, we. How how what what was the feeling in the town or in the community when uh, the person that was charged with um, Clinton's murder was acquitted? You you were there. Well, I was at the court. Yep. Um, it was something I'll never never forget. It was just chaos. There was people. One. Um, one aunt, I think she fainted. I think Nan, Thomas's mum, she might have fainted. Thomas went to take his shirt off to wipe to wipe her face down or something, and I think they thought that he was taking his shirt off to fight. Um, the cameras stuck there, you know, stuck in June's face, going something along the lines of, "Will you ever get over this?" Mm. And it's like, "What the fuck do you think?" You know. <laughs> Um, but I didn't know the family well enough. I'd only sort of been at Marbuck for three months and to say yeah. anything. And Troy, who was 16 at the time, I remember him speaking to the media. Yeah. I, I don't think he remembers that. He, like, I spoke to him and his wife a couple of years ago about that and he, I think it was too, so traumatic. I, he doesn't even recall that. I, I remember, and there's footage of Arnie Elaine, um, oh, uh, yeah. enraged out the front yeah. of the police station. Yeah. Um, really going hard i've seen that um some um, video footage of that so again this is a, this is another thing uh, about which i think is unique with your situation the the three of you is that the only time something happens is when you initiate things and push it and drive it because it was on the back of those protests that we're talking about where police station where people out front of the police station and the anger that um I think it was the commissioner, the, the Pommy uh, bloke, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, came, came up here. It was on the back of that in '96 when the reinvestigation. It was decided that the, all three matters should be reinvestigated. Wouldn't you think that would be done as a matter of course without the protest? <laughs> like, you, you, what do you think? What people think is the natural assumption of um, road to justice? It. For white fella is totally different what you get for black fella, mm. unfortunately in Australia, and especially in Barrabool, in the Nambaka Valley. Yeah. You know, don't ever assume, because you know, you um you go to the police. We've done. We did everything right. We did everything by the book. You know, in regards to trying to get help for our kids. You know, Moody went to the police to report her missing. She looked around first, our family first, then she went to the police. Yep. Rebecca went around looking for Evelyn. Yep. Um, then she come to me and then I went to the police. Mm. And same with um, 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 Thomas. And then that's where everything f falls apart from there on because there was no police response, no appropriate response, no investigation, no... They, it, they automatically went from us reporting that our kids are missing. Well, for at my family, they sent in um, child welfare, child protection kids. Yeah. How did they think that? What made them assume that we'd heard her? They hadn't even come and spoken us to us to think that. How would they get to that conclusion that she we'd done something to her or Rebecca mm. had done something to her? The the fact was that. Uh the person leading the investigation into the, these three murders had never done a homicide investigation mm. before. And uh, I know it's impacted on, on him, um, uh, uh, and I know he did his best, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't resourced and, and perhaps didn't have the experience. But, mm. You know, and that's a sad thing, you know. It's because we were black. We are black. 
how good of a black. And we, we lived on that we live on the outskirts of the town on the fringes on the fringes of, of a town of a community and where they hoped to forget about us and not think about us. Yeah. And you, you and I'm asking the question just because I want you to uh, articulate your thoughts. You honestly believe that's why the investigation was done, let's say substandard. Uh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. 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 I do. Because it's just like when they did get the person to come in and investigate it and it was his first time. I mean, um, honestly, if it was three white children, I don't think they would get a detective fresh who has never done a homicide before yeah. to come in and, and do that for three white children. I, I don't even think it would take that long for them to be taking that long for them to investigate it. I mean, mm. they probably would have found the murderer from the first child if it was three white children, you know, and it's, it's for them to even take a statement of my mum for months later, you know, yeah. when she's not thinking right and everything else, you know, it, it was just all done totally off you know i'm just really disgusted how how it was handled but it wasn't given the due diligence it deserved no it was children no. disappear no they didn't they have not they had no sympathy they had no empathy they had no care there was no duty of care there was no proper procedure or anything you know mm. I don't, i'm not a cop or anything but you know you you, you think you go to a police. You go to the police because you're taught that they're, they're there to help you. And when something major like this happens, you think, "Oh yeah, they're going to be able to find out what's going on, and they'll tell you what to do next." So you put you're putting your faith. Yeah, in yeah the we place. put our faith in the in the New South Wales police, and we got nothing until you you and your crew come along. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well Sorry. Well, it's the truth. It's the truth. We got nothing. And, and look, it's not me sitting here judging the original investigation, but at least at that point in time, that it was clear that it warranted proper resources and put uh, proper resources on it to reinvestigate it. It shouldn't have got to that point. No, it like shouldn't we, have, we no. shouldn't have had to reinvestigate it. should no, have been done. But, and it shouldn't have taken protest and another two kids to go missing for something to be done. Yeah. Mm. As soon as Mooney walked into the... Um, the police station and said something about Colleen, something should have started happening then. There should have been alert, you know, someone, the police should have been on, on notice that something was happening. Do you ever, do you ever think if uh, Colleen's investigation was done differently, as in actually did an investigation on it, that uh, Evelyn... She would never, she would never have gone missing. Yeah. She wouldn't have got murdered. She wouldn't have been taken. Because that person would have been known. He was, the, the police was out looking for somebody, mm. or, you know, aware something was happening. Mm. You know, and maybe the police would have went and questioned that person. Put then. pressure on. Yeah. 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 I, I think if I, I look at it, and I, I don't want to sort of go. I, it's more your story. I don't yeah. want to just talk about the, the policing. But I, I think the. Mistakes that were made that they didn't appreciate the seriousness of what was going on right no, from the start, not. and and certainly yeah, three kids, one town it should have the town should have been turned upside down. Yeah, it should have been. Mm. You know, um, they were looking everywhere else because I understand you know they were looking out at Warri, um, surveilling somebody out there because they thought Evelyn was out there. We've given all the mm. family out there and that. It's it's. You just can't imagine it. It's just unbelievable that this has happened. Because you, you, you like to think that we don't live in a society where this happens. Yeah. And and you hate, because the people I deal with in that and the people I work with, they're lovely. And I, wouldn't, I don't hear a racist thing out of their mouths. And, you know, they treat me with the utmost respect. But then you get a, a small minority, like I said before, that just make it bad and just make you just stop and think is it is this really happening to mm. us you know because we had no one to turn to yeah we had no one to turn to and we went to the obvious people we were supposed to turn to yeah you know and um nothing no police were around i don't i remember that that night i went and um reported Evelyn Wilson. I seen that cop car drop up, well I assume it was him because 
it looked like the car drive up the street that night. That was it. That was the only cop car I seen that night. Yeah. There was nothing else. And then a couple of weeks later, we saw some coppers around. But, you know, I don't even remember. I never got called into a police station for a statement or anything like that. You and Jason took my statement the year of Evelyn's um, trial, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would never gave a statement. That was the first yeah. time I've ever given a statement about Evelyn. Yeah. Until that. And that's like 2006. Seems ridiculous. Something like it? that. Yeah. Like, I'm, I've never been to university. I don't think I'm well, that well educated in that. But, geez, there's some. You, you know, there's something up. There's, something's not going right here. Common, common sense. Common sense. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the town itself. Like, I, I know you've got support, but there's that underlining current or certain people that have got their racist attitudes and it might be uh, they might suppress it but the history of the town too there was a division between black and white in in the town in barrable um yeah the cinema uh, the cinema well like the barrable cinema like back in that time um like the bar the mission is that like i said out on the, on the outskirts out on the outskirts we had the rubbish dump at the back, so all the Nambucca Valley was dumping their rubbish there. And then we had the piggery up on the hill yeah. on the other side. And so you, we had the fresh smell of that. You guys are there. out there in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. And um, my my um, uncles and aunties and my grandparents were always taught that they, if you look at Barrow, there's a, a back lane in the, that's down the back of the houses. They wanted to go downtown, they had to walk down the middle of down there, they wasn't allowed to walk down the main street. They had not, they, they, they wasn't allowed to be seen. And why and is that? Like explain that. So they were that. black. They wasn't allowed to be seen because they were black. And so when they wanted to go to the shops, they had to go walk down this, this this back lane, and still exists today. Goes from one end of the town right down to the other end, like from the mission end right down to the um, river. And so, um, if they wanted to go for shopping and that, they'd have to go. Down the back lane, behind all the houses, come up the side street, get their groceries, then walk back, then go back wherever they want. So educate us on this because to I, I would say a lot of people are thinking that's something in the 1800s, but you're saying this was your this was, your this this well this was still happening when I was young. Yeah, and um, I was born in 96, 19, 1990. 69, sorry. We're all about to jump in there again. Yeah, 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 as is. Yeah, so, but, um, um, and so I was taught that. And um, we had to walk down the main. And my uncles and that, if they wanted to go to the pub, they had to. It's now the coach house. You had to walk up the back lane again, go to the side window at the pub, get your drink. And then come back to the um, um, oh, the saddle, the shed at the back and sit the stables, and they're still there today, standing. Yeah. And um, you, um, my dad's a white man, Burke Adams, and um, he was in the army, and we used to live in Townsville, and then we used to travel down from Townsville, go out to Longridge, see family there, and then we'd travel down to Barrowville. My dad was never allowed on the mission, so he had to stay in town with my uncle and auntie, and or only us was allowed up on the mission because he was a white man. Right. My um, uncle and auntie, Aunt Sandra and Uncle Rod, were the first ones to get permission. They had to get special permission to move off the mission. Now, so talk, they, talk us through that because, again, this is something that people don't understand. Get, they had to get permission. Um, people from over New Zealand saved the children fund built a house in town for um, the Aboriginal people and um, uh, Uncle Rod and Aunt Sandra were the first ones to allow to move off the mission and so they moved off they lived in this house this is the house on North Oak Corner there right yeah that would st stand there now so um, yeah so they had to get special permission to live in there to move there yeah I, um... and um, there was a hospital, my grandmother and my great aunts and all that, for them to have babies, they had to walk 30 kilometres or more up a mountain, a thick bush, to have their babies from Barrowville to Bellingen. 
because they were not allowed to have their babies in the hospital that was unbearable. Mm. And there was a hospital there. So they had to walk. And sometimes they had their babies along the road, up in the bush, in the scrub now. But they had to walk all that way, and heavily pregnant. What, what you're telling this, and I, I dare say the majority of people in the city wouldn't even appreciate that. And that I, I reference the fact that when I came up here as, I was a homicide detective from the city and I had no idea what I was going to be confronted with here. And like I've learnt so much, but I, I was ignorant to that. And I think people still are ignorant and yeah. on what's gone on. I, I talk to a lot of people who I work with... Um, that don't even understand a lot of the history about Aboriginal people and I talk to them about when they had the white only policy in Australia yeah. where they weren't letting any immigrants into the country and if any of our Aboriginal people fought overseas um, in the army then mm. they weren't allowed to back into their own country because it was whites only. Yeah. Um, you know, that to me is really, you know, what? how could you not know that? You know, it's an Australian history that was never told. It's like they sweep it under the carpet and just leave it there. I think to understand the history helps you understand how this investigation went so bad. Mm. Because because of the, those yeah. things. Yeah. This is I, a, I've yeah. even had stories from my own mum telling me that she used to walk past the milk shop, the way you get a milkshake from the takeaway shop, and she was never allowed to go in there. And she can remember the very first time that she ever got to walk into that place and order a milkshake. Yeah. You know, those were still happening when my mum was living there, you know. Um... Um, the elders, my, my grandparents and my aunties and that, a lot of them, a lot of the elders in our community, they, there was a theatre there, they wasn't allowed to enter the Barrable Theatre until the movie actually started and they had to go through the side entrance down below and then they had to sit right at the front on the floor looking up at the screen. So uh, ab Aboriginal people weren't allowed in? In, into the city, they were allowed, but they had to go down. Yeah, they had to go into the cinema after the movie started. They wasn't allowed to get a comfortable yeah. seat beforehand. Yeah. so they had to walk in afterwards and sit down right down the front on the floor. I, look up at the I, I saw the seats they were on display in an exhibition down in Sydney um, yeah. uh, uh, years ago, but. Uh, uh, half a dozen seats from Barrowville Cinema and it was about the protest march, yeah, Charles yeah. Perkins or yeah. the Freedom Bus Ride yeah. and they actually, because he called in at Barrowville yeah. uh, amongst other towns because of the racist yeah. issues in the town and they had those seats actually on, on display down well, there. Barrowville was a part, I don't know if it was Barrowville itself or was the, the area but when the referendum come out mm. for Aboriginal people to have the vote, I believe our area was the highest or the second highest in New South, in Australia or in the state, to say no. Yeah, I, 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 I have heard that. And yeah, that, Kempsey was... Yeah, um, yeah. well, we come under Kempsey, Kempsey then. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that was it. That, yeah. that says something. So it's the, this sort of backdrop is where an investigation can go so bad. Leanna, you came into the town. Yeah. What, what's your What's your impression of it? Because you were from um, Tasmania. No, Sydney. Sydney. Oh, your family yeah. down yeah, in I Tasmania. Was family yeah. in Tasmania. Tassie, but I grew up um, in Bankstown. Right. And what were your impressions? Well, it was a big culture shock to me. Yeah. I'd never been on a mission, and I'd never really been around Aboriginal people, and all of a sudden, I'm on a mission, and you know, Thomas is. But burn and you know, yeah. and crying and you know, it was it was just it was totally different to me because I grew up in a um, middle class white suburban, dare I say, probably racist, fairly racist yeah. family where um, I think oh, religious. I don't know if that had something to do with the racism, but mm. I remember as a kid and I love my parents you know yeah. but we see things very differently and um, I don't know how I ended up the way I ended up but, mm. <laughs> but it, I remember as a kid in the 70s when all the land rights stuff was you know and mum was listening to ABC radio and was saying something and I was washing up she was wiping up and she said oh the abos they get everything for nothing why should they get everything for nothing and I said well they were here first <laughs> and I got in yeah. so much trouble. I think I was destined for. <laughs> yeah. But but coming in, you know, meeting the family it was. It took a while for me to for me to adjust. I suppose is the right word. But you but, you you. But I loved it. 
you would see how the families in this situation get treated differently totally. when, because yeah. of what happened yeah. and the response and, to and, it. You know, uh, over the years, I can think of a couple of people, including a, an ex-Attorney General who's denying that racism ever played a part in these investigations. Well, as a white person, you can't say racism doesn't exist because you don't fucking experience it. Yeah. And I mean, I don't experience it, but I see my kids experience, I see my partner experience it. Yep. But it's not the same. But how can they say it doesn't happen when it never happens to them? Well, we'll um, talk in the second part of the podcast about the fight that you guys have kept going to get the, get the justice. But from the, the impact and the way the investigation is done, the, the community is carrying that uh, pain to this day. Would yeah, well, I, yeah, I see my family and I always say I'm, I can speak for my family um, and I'm not a bearable spokesperson, you know, um, um, but I see the pain on my family, the armies, the uncles, Thomas and June, and it's, it's never going to go away. It's totally changed their lives. And I, I think there's none of us here sitting at this table that wouldn't agree wholeheartedly that it would have been treated differently if it was uh, three white kids that yeah, disappeared yeah. in and, those and circumstances. Really, you know, yeah. I'm really, it really aches, hurts me to say that, mm. to think that our society is like that. And, um, you know, like Beck and Bill, you know, you want to just feel the, fix their pain and that, but you just can't because just nothing's been done to give answers mm. to their questions. They've got burning questions as to why, why did you do this? Um, why aren't you, you know, you get taught that you do something wrong, you go to the police, you get punished. Mm. They, not, not in this case, they just, everything <coughs> fell, fell apart. Yeah. And there's still all that big question, why and the anger, why didn't you help us? Of course mm. you're going to feel angry and and protest and, you know, demand answers. You know, parents are brought in this world, adults are brought, and when we become adults, we are taught it's an innate thing in us to protect our kids, um, our children, mm. and, and to protect kids. And that's what we are doing, and we are fighting for justice. We would be letting not only Evelyn, Killington and Colleen down, but we would be letting our kids down, at, at, um, my daughter down, um, all our nieces and nephews down in, if we didn't fight for justice because we'd be saying this is okay Yeah. if we didn't con continue to fight. Mm. We'd be saying it's okay to um, um, be treated like dirt and be disregarded. Mm. Yeah. The pain the families have suffered is unimaginable. You can hear it in their voices. One thing I've learnt investigating homicides as long as I have is that the victim's families never truly get over losing a loved one. The pain the bearable families have suffered is magnified by the fact they feel nobody cared. I hope you join us for part two of the bearable families on I Catch Killers. We'll be discussing their extraordinary efforts to find justice for their murdered children. Their story needs to be told. See you next time.